our desire and our heart is not just hear this word, but for this word to become a reality. And I'm just going to do a recap. By the way, if, if, if you get lost anywhere in between, we've had five days of this teaching on, on, during the lunch hour meetings, so you can uh, revisit our handle. I think it should be put on the screen at some time. And uh, if you have not subscribed to the church page, just do so on you. You will catch up on those teachings and they will transform your life. Remember that the more you hear something, the more you understand it. The more you keep hearing and hearing, but the Bible says faith cometh by hearing. Yeah? By hearing, only hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So you can't hear the word of God once and understand it. You must hear it and hear it and hear it. That is what mastery is all about. You hear something until you stop asking what does it mean and you know. Now let me tell you how you know you have understood a thing. If you can explain what you know to a four-year-old and they understand, then you have mastered what you are talking about. You understand? If you cannot explain what you are trying to say to a four-year-old, then you don't know your content. Are we together? That is how you know you have mastered something. So if you know you have mastered money, you should be able to explain finance to a four-year-old and they should understand. That's how you know you have mastered. If you can't, then you need to study and study until you can break it down to a four-year-old. So if you cannot teach the Holy Spirit to a four-year-old and they understand what you're saying, Pastor Jess, at some point, I remember we were in school together. If you can't, the proper topic for the Holy Spirit is what? I know there is angelology, there is a sartoriology. It's, is it hum, no, it's new, something to do with pneuma. Yeah? There is homiletics, hermeneutics. If, you can't, if I can't explain that to four-year-olds, then I don't know what I'm talking about. You understand? And my prayer is also that as the word of God comes today, it will come as unto a child. So I'm telling you, if I lose you in the service, because we only have like 30, 40 minutes, go back to the messages of the week and we'll master this content. So this is the year of what? Fruitfulness. As a ministry, God wants us fruitful. And that is why sometimes I normally tell people, it's good to be consistent with where you go to church so that you can master content because for our ministry God told the pastor this year will be an year of fruitfulness ours is not the year of kufinywa you understand we have gone through the season here kufinywa maybe another church's word is the year of kufinywa personally I have no business with kufinywa because this is my year of fruitfulness and if your fruitfulness is not coming out of your mouth then we have no relationship with this year. Let's meet on 1st January. Probably that time we might relate. But this year I only want to surround myself with the voice of fruitfulness. Okay? So I don't know who you are listening to and this is paramount in where we are going with this message. I don't know what you are exposing yourself to this year but if you are not exposing yourself to fruitfulness this is just going to be a word. And it is just going to fill that 200-page notebook with notes that mean nothing. With a topic in the beginning, 2024, the year of fruitfulness. Some of you at least have 400 pages notebooks that even have the last three years topics for the year which never manifested. And do you know why sometimes they don't manifest? Because you expose yourself to too many things. Okay? The Apostle Paul says, This one thing I do. I do what? How many things? One thing. This one thing I do. Most Christians, these 42 things I am doing. These 15 things I am doing. And these three things 
I am doing. We have a language in English. We say that this person is a jack of all trades and a master of none. If you are going to experience fruitfulness this year, fruitfulness is not magic. Fruitfulness is a mastery or something that must be learned and mastered. Let me read you a scripture so that uh, in Ezekiel, this is not really our main scripture, but I, I just want to show you something. In the book of Ezekiel 47, just trust me so that we move fast. In the book of Ezekiel 47, but you can write it down like the believers from the Berean community. It talks about a certain river that was flowing from under the threshold. Okay? Flowing from under the threshold. And Ezekiel 47 verses 3 and it says, And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through the waters, and the waters were at my ankles. Your ankle talks about your walk. And that river is the anointing of God. So God wants to anoint your walk, so that your walk is anointed. And then he says something, and again measured a thousand and brought me through the rivers, and the waters were at my knees. Now your knees are for prayer. So as you go deeper in the anointing, after God has anointed your walk, he also anoints your prayer. Your prayer life becomes anointed, and you keep going deeper. And then he says, a thousand, and brought me through the waters, and the waters were at my loins. Your loins are your reproductive parts. And so God wants to anoint your productivity in your life. You understand? And then he finishes and says, Afterward a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters had risen to swim. There were waters to swim and, and in, in a river that could not be passed over. And so after your loins and your productivity in your life is anointed, the river overtakes you, and it's only a river that you can swim in. And for me, that speaks about mastery. When something overtakes you, overshadows you, and overcovers you, it's mastery. It's a level of living where you no longer struggle. This is my point. God blesses your walk, blesses your prayer life, but he does not stop there. Do you understand? He also has to bless your productivity because your productivity is what defines you. And after your productivity is blessed, he takes you to the next level. Now, during the lunch hours, I said this, and I would be very careful to speak this in the presence of students because I would like to bring a balance or young children. And the Bible in the book of second, uh, let me not say second, in Proverbs 18, verses 16, it says, the gift of a man shall do what? Shall make room for him. The what? The gift of a man shall make room for him. Uh, let's use the, uh, the KJV. Do you have the King James? Yeah, let's. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. What makes room for you? Your gift. With disclaimer and a lot of caution. It does not say your education makes room for you in life. It says what? Your gift. And education is important, and I'll tell you where it comes in when, it de when it's dealing with your gift. But the Bible says your gift shall make room for you and shall bring you before great men. What shall bring you? Now let's go back. This is a year of what? Fruitfulness. Now the first question is, do you believe this is a year of fruitfulness? How many of you believe this is a year of fruitfulness? How many are not sure this is a year of fruitfulness? How many don't care? Now let me tell you, you, number one, you must know this is a year of fruitfulness. Number two, you must believe that this is going to be your year of fruitfulness. So some of the things that come out of your language when you believe is you start talking. As a fruitful person, you start behaving as a fruitful person person and then you remove the language that is unfruitful from around you 
And I'll tell you why it is important for you to be fruitful. When God created man in the book of Genesis, he said that he gave him dominion and he told him what to do. And then he says, be ye fruitful. That is a command, not a suggestion. He told man, you must be fruitful. And I want you to note, he does not say be seedful. He says be fruitful. Somebody tells you to be fruitful, what does that mean? It means the seed is already in. So God is not telling us to become seedful. He's not telling us to look for the gifts. He's telling you to do what? Manifest the gift. In the book of Timothy, and you can just write this down, 2 Timothy 1.6, the Bible says, he told Timothy, star the gift that is in you. Not receive a gift, but star the gift. Why? Because the gift is in you. What is my point? The gift that God has for you, that will make room for you, is already in you. It doesn't come in you when you get born again. It was placed in you before the foundations of the world. Now, a lot of people normally ask these questions. How can I find my significance in life? How can I find my place in life? If you want to find your significance, if you want to find your place in life, you will find it through your gift. Because your gift is what will make room for you. There is nothing as dangerous as a fish trying to walk the ground. No matter how much faith it has, it was never designed to walk the ground. Now when you put, if, you, if a fish decides it's going to come for the service here and it refuses to come in the aquarium, the devil doesn't have to kill the fish. The fish is going to do what? It is going to die because it is outside of its environment. Is it possible that a lot of things we blame the devil on have nothing to do with the devil? I can tell you that. There is no demon attacking us in some areas of life we think we are being attacked. The reason some of us struggle and find it difficult is because we are fish that are trying to climb trees. We are fish that are trying to plow the ground. And God has not designed us to operate in those realms. And when I understood this, I told myself, I want to find my gift. Because my gift, according to the word of God, is what will make room for me. Now, it is, it is, it is a known fact, whether psychologically or biblically, that every human being wants to be significant. You understand? Every human being wants to be appreciated for the things they do. Anybody who tells you otherwise is just lying. Okay? Everybody wants some significance in life. And that is why sometimes you'll find that people normally make weird hairdos. Why? Because they want to be significant. You'll find some grown-up people dressing with their trousers halfway. It's not, it's not a mental issue. They want to be significant. They want to look different. Okay? You will see people changing their sexes. It's not demonic. This person just wants to look for significance. Okay? Sometimes you'll find people walking differently in a style. It's not joint issues. This person just wants to be significant. Because you are looking for significance. You'll find people putting tattoos in areas that you should not put tattoos. Because when you grow old and you start sagging, those tattoos that once looked like a love heart begin to look like a demon, okay? But the reason they did that was because they wanted to look significant. And you cannot judge people for wanting to be significant. All you need to ask yourself is what is the biblical pattern for significance? Because Jesus has not stopped you from being great. Do you know you're supposed to be great? No, seriously. Church, we say amen, 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 and then we just go and live our mediocre lives, yeah? Do you know that God wants you to be great? Do you know wanting to be great is not a demonic thing? It's a biblical thing. And Jesus encourages it in his word. Remember when the disciples came to him and they said, 
uh, master who will be the greatest. Jesus did not tell them, stop this foolishness. I rebuke that spirit in my name. He did not do that. Jesus told them, if you want to be the greatest, in other words, he was emphasizing and he was saying, there is nothing wrong in wanting to be the greatest. He said, if you want to be the greatest, then you must be the servant of all. Now, servant of all does not mean, you know, how you hear a word and how you interpret the word are two different things. Servant does not mean servant the way we know. Servant. The other meaning for the word servant in the Bible is to deploy. To deploy. In other words, he's saying, if you want to be the greatest, deploy yourself to other people. I'm going to bring you back here. I'm going to bring you back here. And the reason I brought up the stages of prosperity and blessing and anointing from the ankles, the knees, to the loins, and to swimming in is God wants you to be whole, not just spiritually, but productively. You understand? God wants you to be great. And when I say great, it's not just great where you leave a legacy of prayer in your family, but you leave more than a legacy of prayer and a godly work, but a legacy of productivity for the next generation. You understand? Just look at your neighbor and tell them, do you know God wants you to be great? No, just speak to them. Don't fear them. They, they'll take you nowhere. Just say, do you know? Not hoping. Do you know that God wants you to be great? Now, if you can settle that question and you can say without you are in, without saying, oh, if it is the will of God. No, it is. <laughs> he has told you in his word that he wants you to be great. So it is his will for you to be great and for you to be fruitful. So the question is, how do I become great and fruitful? And I can tell you, it is not just by praying. Because as Christians, we have developed the art of hiding under the anointing and prayer. And most of us have refused to polish and work on our gifts. Okay? And I'm not even talking about the gifts that you get when you get born again. I'm just telling you that the thing that God has put in you that makes you you. You know, during the lunch hour, I told people, there's a, a, an, an interesting statistic that was done, and they discovered that most people who die of heart attack all over the world, they die on Monday morning. This is a medical statistic. The people who die of heart attack, most of them die on Monday morning. Do you know why they die on Monday morning? Because they hate what they do. They hate the jobs they go to. They hate the things they are doing. And do you know why they hate the things they are doing? They are not doing what they were born to do. If you do what you were born to do, you have no time for sleep. In fact, people, you find people wasting your time because you're trying to think and we are going to get to this and I want to start this first of all from the level of parents by the way if you have children if you have young children that you're mentoring and you're hoping for them to grow and I know it is important for you parents to encourage your children to go to school but that is not where it starts the first thing you want your children to do is to believe to believe to believe they are worthy you know our our, 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 our education system, and I'm nothing, I went through school, yeah? So I am not judging or, or talking about something I don't know. Our education system was brought by an oppressor and is from a colonial regime. And the education system was to prepare people for a Victorian age that no longer exists. And I'm not saying you don't, could you know some, somebody might go and say, these are these shakahola preachers who against... I'm not go to school. In fact, I am for school. We are in school. My wife is in school, and she's also trying to advance her school. So I'm not saying don't go to school. But I'm telling you, the first thing you want your child to do, even before they sit before a teacher who you are not sure whether they are mentally okay to teach your child, is you want your child to believe. 
And if you mess with your child's belief system, you are going to mess with the rest of their life. Now the reason some families seem to look like everything works for them like magic is not because they are so blessed, but they were taught to believe in themselves from a very young age. And so what do you think will happen? Parent A and parent B. Parent A, when their child wakes up in the morning, you go. You're still sleeping. While all the other normal children are in school, when in boozy, you are still here, you're asleep. Okay? So your boozy wakes up. And remember, this is the boozy you produce. So the mother of the goat is who? Is still a goat, yeah? So here is your goat in the morning that you're waking up. And then this foolish, this goat of yours, when they go to school and they get in math, three percent. What do you tell your goat? You must be a foolish goat. Now this is your goat that you produced with the other he goat or she goat, whatever it is. So now here is your baby goat. Now your, your baby goat is, is not only foolish, but when they come home, you beat them and you, you, you tell them, we wish we gave birth to what? Maybe a pineapple would have made a smoothie and it would have satisfied. So now you're, you're not only born a goat, but your goat is also a pineapple. It could have been a smoothie. Now, that is your language to your, your goat, pineapple. Now, this goat of yours that is also a pineapple goes to school. And one day, because they had not done their work properly, the teacher tells them, you must be stupid. You have not done your work well. And then your goat pineapple believes if mom calls me and dad foolish and the teacher knows these are grown-ups in life, they must be knowing something about me. So I must be a foolish pineapple goat. Now this child grows up and because of that putting down and pushing down, no matter where they go in life, they carry something in them that tell them I'm not good enough. And most of these children are A material. They score A's in class, but they end up being employed by D pluses that are confident. Because here is the D student, parent B. You're blessed of the Lord. You are the head and not the tail. Yet in class, this guy has been holding the tail since the birth of Jesus. This guy is always the tail, but the parents' words are, you are the head and not the tail. You are the blessed of the Lord, and we appreciate you. We love you. You're given assignments by your parents where they don't keep correcting you. And I'll tell you, for those of you who always try to correct your children, leave them. Leave them. Sometimes let them make decisions even when they are wrong because you are teaching them confidence and you are teaching them the ability to make decisions. That's why some of you, even when you go to a hotel and somebody asks you, what do you want? See, I'll eat what you are eating. If you can't make a decision on a how will you make serious decisions in life? Takula nini, whatever that one is eating. What does your brain tell you? What do you want? You see how young it starts. Why? Because you never allowed your children to make decisions. You always tried to correct them until they thought we must be stupid so other people should decide for us. And they never decide. How many children do you want? I don't know. How many do you want? Well, at least you have a brain for yourself. Start thinking. How many children do you want? I want 24 and pretend there are two dozens, yeah? I want 12 and pretend they are donuts. I want six children. I want one child. Just ask your neighbor, what do you want to be when you grow up? Most of them will tell me, I have no idea. Even at 40, there are people who don't know what they want and they're already grown up. Do you know why? Because as children, they were put down. They were put down. You wanted to be a musician, your father said no. You're going to be daddy's doctor. You are going to live out 
your father's failed dreams. And so we have people here who are frustrated. You are engineers, but you are depressed. You are doctors and you are depressed. Probably you should have been comedians and musicians. But somebody told you, oh, you are going to get an education and you are going to get a job. There is that song that used to sing during our time. Ukisoma, utapata, kazi nzuri. And then you work for 60 years and then you realize working does not make you wealthy. Working is the worst way. And when I mean working, I mean employment. Being employed is the worst way to become wealthy in life. That is the bottom. You know, employed people are normally the, the bottom, brokest people in life. If you are employed and you are not using employment to grow your gift. And, and my prayer is that I'm able to come out clearly. There is a difference between your job and your work. Just write that. Job, work. But I didn't come to cast out any demons. You have no demons. By the way, there are no demons in this church. The anointing and the kuzagazaga that goes on here. There are no demons within 50 kilometer radius here. Whatever is disturbing you is just mental issues and stupidity. Yeah, I'm sorry for talking like that, but I'm not sorry. Because sometimes foolishness just has to leave, yeah? Your problem is not demonic. Just look at somebody. Don't you gamma. You have not demon. It's not even that neighbor of yours you think is a sorcerer. It's not your neighbor. Nobody rogged at you and planted something in your compound. The only thing they planted in your compound are pumpkins and carrots. There is no, there is no witchcraft. Your problem is just that somebody taught you wrong. And somebody raised you wrong. And I'm not saying your parents failed. But they were also raised by parents who didn't know. And they were raised by another generation that didn't know. So you are replicating what you found. But then the Bible comes and says, if you're going to have a significance in life, then you're going to pursue your gift. And then the Bible says your gift will make room for you and bring you so what is work? You know, when, when, when uh, let me close my Bible so that I, I just speak from my heart. When Adam was put in the Garden of Eden, Bible says he was given work, to work the field. Now work, please write this down, work is not something you do. I always thought work is something you do. Work is not something you do. Work is something you become. Work is something you become. And I'm telling you, you had better put up your mind. That is what I'm saying. This year, don't, don't just read about those people who, are, who have 50 demons or who are delivered from 32 demons or who, who have been uh, uncovering things in their compounds. This year, spend your time studying and reading about fruitfulness and how to improve what God has put in you. The word work means to become. To become. That is what one of the words. In other words also the word work means to manifest. The word work means manifest. When God put Adam in the garden he told Adam I want you to become. I want you to manifest. When we say we, what we are we normally say we are human beings. Okay. You are a human being not a human doing. You're a human being. You are. So work is something you become. Manifest. So when he put him in the garden of Eden, he told him, Adam, there is stuff in you that I want you to manifest. Let me break that down a little bit further. When fish swim, we say that is work. You understand? When birds fly, we say the birds are working. They're flying, but they're actually working. When animals run the ground, we normally say they are working. Yet there is no fish that goes to swimming schools because swimming is built into the fish. So when you throw the fish in the water, what does it do? It manifests in its area. 
If you put a fish on the ground and hope that it will behave like an earthworm, it's going to, to die. So I want you to understand, work does not mean doing, doing, move these seats. That is a job. The day you discover your work, nobody can fire you. People can fire you from a job, but they can never fire you from work. And that is why you need to find your work, so that if you are laid off where you go for your job, you still have work. That is the ultimate purpose of that. I was so blessed by the last scripture you read. I think it must have been Acts 20, 20, 24, 24, 20. Where it says, my life means nothing if I am not doing the work that, or the gift that has been placed in me. So, without even going further, do you understand as of now, there is a gift in you that needs to be manifested. And that gift is not reporting to job. And I'm not saying you stop your job because your job should be able to finance the building of your work. And that is why I told you the lowest level of being fruitful and being wealthy. And you know when, when we say wealthy, we are talking about the way the Bible says Abraham was. Was Abraham wealthy? No, the Bible says Abraham was very wealthy. You understand? There is a difference between wealthy and very wealthy. And he was not in the anointing. The Bible even specifies how wealthy he was. The Bible says he was wealthy in what? In land, in cattle, and gold. Now, have you ever visioned yourself that you are so blessed that you stop banking Kenya shillings? You know, when we think about wealth here, we think about you getting an Mpesa loan of 20,000. Yeah, that's not wealth. <laughs> that's been that's been demonically oppressed, yeah. <laughs> Getting an investor loan is not wealth. You understand? That is you been coming a slave of somebody. Anybody who has a loan here is a slave of somebody else. So even if we come here and we are free and free indeed, you are not because the Bible says the borrower is the subject of who? The lender. So as long as you are debt free, and I'm saying we all start there. So if you have Fuliza, your boss is who? NCBS, isn't it? If you have Mpesa, <laughs> who is your boss? Now if you have some of those mad Shylocks, or some of those crazy, those are your masters. Are you understanding? <laughs> so me, I'm not, that is not the wealth I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about wealth, you have two kabambes, yeah, or two smartphones. That is not wealth. The kind of wealth we are talking about, and, 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 and don't get confused, I'm, I'm not just talking about money, but I am right now talking about money. The kind of wealth that God wants to deposit into your life stream is so that you can leave an inheritance for who? For your children's children. Now the Bible says a good man does what? leaves an inheritance for who? For his children's children. So let's play around with English. A good man does what? He leaves an inheritance for who? Not for his children, for his children's children. So let's now do the reverse. A bad man does what? He does not leave an inheritance for his Children's children. I normally ask this question. How many of you know your great great grandfather? How many of you? How many of you know your great great grandfather? Only one person. Do you know why the rest of you don't know your great grandfather? Because he left you nothing. He left you nothing. Probably he only left bills. Because if your great-grandfather was somebody like Bill Gates or somebody like Steve Jobs, when you are going for the funeral, you are celebrating because you know something has been left. Now forget about your grandfather. Will your great-great-grandchildren know you? And what will they know you for? Is there anything 
And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but I'm just trying to make you ask some serious questions with how am I going to get to that level? And we, 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 we don't want to limit ourselves to a life of mediocrity, but you know we need to wake up and ask ourselves some serious questions. Normally people say when a white man dies, he leaves a will. But when a black man dies, he leaves a bill. <laughs> Are you going to leave a will or a bill? Come on, just ask your neighbor. What are you going to leave for the people behind you? Are people going to cry because they miss you? Or they are crying because you have left a bill? And these are not the kind of things we, we dance about here in church. I know it's good to come feel good. You know, church is sort of an, uh, a, an anesthetic that numbs you from the realities of life. So you come here, you dance. You come here, you feel good. And you forget your problems for 15 minutes. Because prayer is therapeutical. Th prayer has psychological effects on you that resets the reality of life. And prayer is good. We are in a prayerful church. I love prayer. I love being in this environment. I enjoy the environment of prayer. But prayer is not going to pay your bills. And how I know it's not going to pay your bills, the next time Safari com I know, uh, Kenya Power comes to your meter, I want you to speak in tongues. So you'll kuzaga there as you watch them disconnect. Yep. Nyawaska does not care how deep you are in the spirit. After every 30 days, on the 15th or the 18th, what do they want? Yes, not prayers. They want money. When your children get sick, You had better be seriously anointed or you have money in you. Because when you go to the hospital, they don't care whether you are the holiest pastor in town. They want down payment before your child or you can be admitted. Are you understanding? And these are some of the things Christians don't think about because to Tainda, Zayuni. And in Zayuni, Akuna, Magonjwa. But right now, this is not. <laughs> For you to be in church, you need. So just ask for your name. I don't want to shout. Are you where you want to be financially? Are you in your dream life? Is that your dream life? Is, is, that, is that it? Is that it? If you are not, thank God. Because you need to start working on your gift. Because within you is deposited the ability to expand and become great. If, and don't think you're old. You know, when you think about men like Colonel Sanders, the one who started the KFC chicken. When did he start KFC it was at the age of around 60 something. After working for all those years and then retirement he was given a gold watch. After working for over 50 years and he asked himself, what am I going to do? <laughs> and here is what I'm telling you. If you think working hard will make you wealthy, then donkeys should be the wealthiest animals on the face of the earth. And the people who dig trenches on the side of the roads, naked, half naked, should be wealthy. And please understand this, without trivializing what other people do. Colonel Sanders decided he always wanted to cook and he loved chicken. And he decided he's just going to make fried chicken for a few friends. And he made chicken for those people and they loved the chicken. They began ordering his chicken. And then it became so successful, he opened a business. And then he franchised it. And then so many branches all over the world. By the time he was dying, KFC was making and still makes so much money, more than he needed, that he assigned only a portion to himself. And the rest was distributed to other things. At 60, working for all his life. But when he found his gift 
he broke through. Some of you are sitting on gifts. And somebody is oppressing you with a salary of 80,000. And your gift is worth millions. And I'm not saying you leave your job. But I'm telling you, leverage your job and find your gift. Because your gift is what is going to help you get wealthy. I said this during the lunch hour and we're almost winding up. The, the poorest people are the ones on the level of employment. Leave alone the other ones who are not working. The other ones, we don't even know how to define them. But we are praying that God find, gives them something. So the ones who are job employed are normally on the poorest level of wealth. Now we are talking about wealth creation, okay? We're not talking about real money, wealth creation. So after you move from employment, there's another level up there called management. These are people who manage other people to work. They make a significant amount because of their management skills, but they are tied down to that job. They are tied down to that job that they can do nothing else. Now, the people who really actually start making it in life, they're up here in, in an area in the gifts of communication. These are speakers. These are people who are gifted, eloquent. These are people probably who are, are, are in, in the creative fields. These are singers. These are people who are able to articulate their gifts well. And then the wealthiest people in the world are in the imaginative realm. These are people who have taken their gifts. These are inventors. These are people like Bill Gates who started their companies where? At home. These are people like Steve Jobs who began their companies where? At home. These are all the big names you hear about. People who polish their gifts. So now my question is, let's come back. Let's assume, now I'm assuming you have found your gifts. Say amen. <laughs> I'm assuming now you have found your gift. What do I do with my gift? The Bible says, he who does what? Turneth it. Turneth it. He who stars it. It begins to do what? To shine. And when it begins to shine, it begins to attract. So when you find your gift, the next thing you do is that you keep using it and doing it until you become very good at it. Think about people like the late Michael Jackson. What was Michael Jackson's gift? Singing. Since they were young, five-year-old boys, four-year-old boys, they were doing what? Singing, music, dance, all that kind of stuff. By that, and they used to go part-time school, yeah? And I'm not saying you do that. But they were so gifted. And by the time he was dying, Michael Jackson had moved from being a singer to the next level of what you become when you polish your gift. You become a consultant. You understand? Now just pretend you know what I'm talking about. There's a difference between a person who does the job and a consultant. A consultant does, is not paid for the work they do. A consultant is paid for the knowledge they have. That is why when you are told you're going to pay for a doctor who is a consultant, the doctor does not actually treat you, but he can diagnose and do everything, and then that recommendation is sent to the doctor who will actually work on you. Are you understanding? So you can polish your gift, make it good, for those of you who are in business, you are in HR, you are in those departments, instead of you wasting your time over the weekends, going and watching series, five, six, seven episodes, wasting your life, or sitting down there to watch a 90-minute football match of billionaires chasing the liver of a pig in the field for 90 minutes, and you are broke. And the only money you have is the one you normally talk about. We bought Messi for $2 billion. You bought Messi. And you can't afford a piece of fish. But you bought. Tell your neighbor, stop buying Messi. And come back to earth. Leave Messi alone. And Ronaldo. And all those people you buy, stop buying them. And start, fight, start fast asking yourself, what is my gift? What am I going to be known for? 
So we know Messi for what? For football. We know Steve Jobs for what? For Apple company. We know KFC for what? For his chicken. So that's our neighbor. Apart from gossip, what, what else do people know you for? Apart from the latest gossip, what are you known for? Don't fear your neighbor. I know some of them, you know, they pretend to look serious. This is a house of God. Just tell, I'm talking to you. I know you're pretending to look serious. I'm not afraid of you and I don't even know you. <laughs> what are you going to be known for? And if we don't do these things in church, we are going to waste a, a generation in church of people who are waiting with their phones raised up in the air, waiting for Mpesa to come in. There is no Mpesa coming in. <laughs> you shake that phone, the only thing you'll destroy maybe are the internal organs of the phone. There is no money coming in like that because there's a system that God has denied for wealth to come to you. And it's not being busy. It's finding your gift and then turning that gift and becoming perfect in that gift until you become a consultant. And the other name for consultant is a counselor. You give out. That is why Jesus is called mighty counselor. He had and it was to save humanity. That is why he did not heal everybody. You know, the other day people were asking, how comes Benny Hinn didn't come to this country to heal? That is not his work. Jesus did not even heal everybody in his lifetime. Do you know why? Because healing is not what brought him. Jesus' purpose and task to come to earth was to die. He actually brought one person back to life in his whole ministry. Really dead person, Lazarus. The other one people can argue a lot medically and all that. Lazarus is the one we know was properly dead. That was the only person we know he brought back to life and, 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 and whatever else you want to read. Why? Because that was not his mission. His mission was to die for the sins of humanity. Nobody could die like Jesus. And I bring you back to that closing point. This one thing I do. I know you're multitasked. You're multi-talented. That's good. You're a jack of all trades. But what can we come to you for when we want an expert? You know, in this town, I believe there are like 40, 50, 60, 200 mobile phone repairers. Now, all you need to do to be a, a mobile phone repairer is to own a nice set of fine screwdrivers. That is the first level. You can be able to open up a phone without breaking the, the screen. But after you opened it, what are you going to do? Lisa and I once took a, a, a very expensive phone to some guys who claimed to be phone repairers. And by the time we got our phone back, the phone was mad. And I was wishing, I hope that the repairer is one who should have been. Not the phone. So you know there are levels in things. So even when you go to town, <laughs> there are levels of the people you're going to interact with. And here are my closing remarks. The Bible says that God shall bless what? Tell your neighbor the prayers of your mouth. Sindio. No, come on, quote to them that scripture. It's found in the book of Abraham, chapter 4. God shall bless the prayers of your mouth. Abraham, chapter 4, verses 18. God shall bless the prayers. What does he say? And God shall bless the works of your hands. Here's my conclusion. You will receive as a reciprocation indirect proportion to the value you bring to life. Let me break that down. 
you do not receive because you have been alive for long. You receive great because of the value you bring to the table. You understand? You will be reciprocated for the value you bring. So your number one question should not be how can I make more money? That's the wrong question. And that is where we fail. And these are my closing remarks. You do not need to ask yourself how can I make more money. What you should be saying is how can I become more valuable? How can I become more valuable? There's a, there's a uh, just not very far from here. If you go there for tea, how much do you think tea will cost? About 25 shillings, yeah? And if you go to that place, you don't ask many questions. You just take the tea and you are thankful if you leave the hotel alive. You understand? You don't ask many questions. But if you move from that hotel and you go to a hotel, maybe like White Rhino, how much is tea in White Rhino? About 200 shillings, yeah? And let's say you leave White Rhino and you go to a place like Kempinski. How much do you think tea or coffee in Kempinski would be about? You're talking a thousand plus, yeah? Now, all these people milk cows. There are no people who milk angels. There is no hotel that mink, milks angels that the, the reason they sell their tea expensive is the milk comes from angels. They only milk all these useless cows we are, normally have that eat nylon. They, they are the same cows that are milked. But the reason one hotel can sell milk for 25 shillings, another one for 200, and another one for 2,000 is what? The value addition the value addition the value addition so ask your neighbors we close what are you doing to add value to yourself what are you doing you know some people think oh just because we pray we are going to be wealthy no you and sometimes that's why intercessors are broke yeah and and and, and god forbid i i'm not saying this church i'm talking about the ones in russia Sometimes that is why, because people think that because we have prayed a lot, then God, desire, uh, he, he's entitled to, to pay us. Preachers also think that just because you're preaching a lot, you're going to be. If you preach sermons, the Bible says you will reap pulpit. You will never lack a place to, to preach, but that does not mean you're going to be wealthy. But if I take my gift of preaching and teaching, and I package it, and I move it to another level, I start thinking of writing books, or I start thinking of starting a, a channel that is going to reach people out there. Now, I have moved my gift, and I've added value to it, and within time, my gift will start bringing back. So just tell your neighbor for me, stop praying for things you're supposed to be working for. Go and look for your gift. Start stirring that gift. Begin to answer those difficult questions. And forgive me for disappointing you with this message. I know you wanted fire. I don't have fire. But Anthony will be here next Sunday to, to release fire. I have no fire to give you. My work here is to wake up your head. Because some heads have been asleep here for 30 years. They are like the guy who was seated at the pool for 38 years of doing nothing. Yet that head has the ability to start an industry. That ability in you, including you students. I know students who right now are not just students, but have their companies while in school. When others are buying Messi, these guys have million dollar industries while in college. While others are trying to compete who has more than seven girlfriends. Other guys are building industries. 
And I'm telling you, as long as you are broke, nothing will change. Nothing. The only thing that will change is that your prayers will become, will become more depressing. And the people at home will still mistreat you. And it is better to be rich than to be poor. In all earnestness. And that is why when you go for your village meetings, even in December, your sisters can come dressed with miniskirts that would drive the village elder to a heart attack. But you with all your prayers, when you come, they meet you at the gate with what? With a lesson. And your skirt is down here. What's the difference? Money. Not anointing. I told you anointing without money equals annoyance. <laughs> that is why your brothers can come home, your rich brothers, and they can smoke, smoke bangi in the compound. And your mother will say, nothing. But you come there with your fermented porridge. So at a busa, busa, utakunyo. Do you know why they treat you like that? Tell your neighbor, it's not that they hate you. <laughs> it's not that you have demons. The brokenness. It's just poverty. Because there is nothing you're bringing to the table. And it is true they'll call you to pray, but they'll even tell you, make sure that your prayers are short. And then they can talk nonsense with the, the rest. Do you still want to be poor? <laughs> Just put your hands on your head. Just tell God, God, give me a head that works. In Jesus' name. May this head work for me this year. Yes, to come. And the rest of my life. I am sorry for sitting on this head and not allowing it to work. But from today, may you jump start it. May you erase every form of foolishness and stupidity and negative teaching and wrong ideologies that I have possessed as my own and may you set me free to 